In this video, we're going to derive the Maclaurin series for a function in general, and then we're going to apply that to the function f of x equals sine x. So the whole idea here is that we propose, provided our function is well-behaved enough, meaning we can take lots of derivatives of it, that any function could be written as a polynomial with possibly infinitely many terms in it. And here's a look at the polynomial representation for some function f of x. It would start with a constant, then a linear term, a quadratic term, and so on and so on. In sigma notation, this is what it looks like. The sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of cn x to the n. And in the past, we've called this a power series centered at 0, meaning it's very likely to converge when x is close to 0 because I have higher and higher powers of x in the series. So now we just start to pick off these coefficients one at a time, and we're going to figure out what their value is in terms of the function f and its derivatives and we should be able to find a general solution for the Maclaurin series. So the standard trick is like this. I notice that if I plug in 0 for x, every term is going to vanish except for c0 out in front. I'll just write a couple of those. All right, if I plug in x equals 0, I have a c1 times 0 in the second term, c2 times 0 squared, which is 0 in the third term, and so on. Everything vanishes except for c0, so I've already found one of my coefficients c0 is simply f of 0. All right, how are we going to expose c1 so that we can do something similar? All I do is take the first derivative of this function. That's where the assumption of differentiability is important. So I'm assuming that our function is well behaved enough for this to be possible. When I differentiate c0, I get 0. But when I differentiate the linear term, I get c1. And then I get a 2c2x. 3c3x squared, a 4c4x cubed, and so on. Now it looks like I can pick off c1 by plugging in x equals 0. So f prime of 0 is going to be c1 plus a bunch of terms that vanish, and I find c1. Now so far this doesn't seem so bad, but there will be a slight complication as we get into the higher order derivatives. Let's get a second derivative of f gives me 2c2 plus 3 times 2 times c3x, and so on. And this time, when I evaluate at x equals 0, I do manage to get that coefficient c2, but now there's a 2 stuck to it. Again, all the rest of the terms vanish because they have x's in them. And this time I get c2 is equal to 1 half f double prime of 0. Continuing this process, I take another derivative to expose another coefficient. This time I get 3 times 2 times c3 plus 4 times 3 times 2 c4x plus additional terms with higher powers of x. I evaluate this at x equals 0, and I get 3 times 2 times c3 plus terms that vanish. So I'll just write it as a 0 this time. And this time I have c3 is equal to 1 over 3 times 2 f triple prime of 0. So I'm starting to see things that look like factorials. I'm just going to do one more coefficient just to verify that that's what's going on. So the notation for fourth derivative is just a little parentheses 4. And when I take this derivative, c4 is exposed. I get 4 times 3 times 2 times c4 plus terms that have x's in them. So when I evaluate this at x equals 0, I get my c4 coefficient. And that's going to be 1 over 4 times 3 times 2 fourth derivative of f evaluated at 0. So now I realize I'm looking at factorials in these denominators. So this is going to help me to express things in general to find the nth coefficient. c4 is 1 over 4 factorial, fourth derivative of f evaluated at 0. c3 is 1 over 3 factorial, third derivative of f evaluated at 0. c2 is 1 over 2 factorial, because 2 factorial is just equal to 2. Second derivative evaluated at 0 c1 is just 1 over 1 factorial, which is just 1. First derivative evaluated at 0. 
and then C0 is 1 over 0 factorial, if you remember that 0 factorial is defined to be 1. And then just to continue my notation here, I could call that the 0th derivative, in other words, the original function evaluated at 0. And so we've discovered a general formula for the nth coefficient of this infinitely long polynomial for any well-behaved function, and it's just 1 over n factorial multiplied by the nth derivative of the function I'm trying to represent, evaluated at 0. And finally, I could write down my general solution for the Maclaurin series of a well-behaved function. That's the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity, nth derivative of the function evaluated at 0 over n factorial, multiplied by x to the n. So now we have a general method to just immediately express any well-behaved function as an infinite series centered at x equals 0. So let's apply our results to a specific function, and we're going to use the sine function here, which certainly you can differentiate as many times as you like, so it's a nice well-behaved function. And just a reminder, the Maclaurin series proposal is that you can express any function f of x as an infinitely long polynomial. So this thing that's in summation notation here, the first term is constant, the second is linear, the third is quadratic, and so on and so on. And we found a general solution for those coefficients of x to the n. And it's just 1 over n factorial, nth derivative of the function evaluated at 0. So to find the Maclaurin series for sine x, we're going to need a lot of derivatives of sine x. And I'm just going to try to organize those over here. And there's the first couple. The derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. The next derivative is negative cosine. And on the next one, we're back where we started. So these derivatives sort of cycle every four times. One more for good measure. All right, I can see from my formula for the coefficient cn that I need to evaluate the original function and all these derivatives at x equals 0. And that's quick enough to do. So if I evaluate the sine function at 0, I get 0. If I evaluate the cosine function at 0, I get 1. So I'm just going to plug all those in real quick. So it looks like only our odd ends are surviving here. And I'll go ahead and write down c1. And that's 1 over 1 factorial. And then my first derivative evaluated at 0. So 1 over 1 factorial times 1, which is a long way of saying 1. Um, c0 is 0 because f of 0 was 0. c2 is 0 because f double prime of 0 was 0. c3 is the next survivor. And so I should get 1 over 3 factorial. And then my third derivative of f evaluated at 0, which came out to negative 1. So I get negative 1 over 3 factorial. c4 vanishes. c5 is 1 over 5 factorial. Fifth derivative of f evaluated at 0, which was 1. So I get 1 over 5 factorial. Finally, I can express the sine function, maybe in expanded form first. So c1 is 1. So I end up with a 1 multiplying x to the first power. c3 is negative 1 over 3 factorial. So I have a negative 1 over 3 factorial times x to the third power. Plus c5 is 1 over 5 factorial. x to the fifth power. And it looks like an alternating series. So put a minus there and dot, dot, dot. And hopefully we see the pattern. It looks like an x to the n over n factorial thing, except it's alternating and it's only the odd terms. So it's going to be a little tricky to write down in summation notation. I want to start out with a positive here. So that's going to be like a negative 1 to the n. When I plug in 0, I get a, a 1 out of that. I plug in 1, I get a minus sign out of it. So that's good. And then I need only the odd powers of x as I plug in higher and higher values of n, starting with x to the first. So. That looks like 2n plus 1. Plug in 0 for n and you get 1. Plug in 1 for n and you get 3. And so on and so on. I also want just the factorials of these odd terms. So 2n plus 1 factorial. And there we have it. That's the sine function expanded into a power series. It's often useful to look at this thing in expanded form. So just to clean up the previous line a little bit. The sine function is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial, and so on and so on. And that's the form I actually remember. And then if I have to put it in summation notation, I'll just think it through real quick. 
The last thing I want to do here is find the interval of convergence for the sine function. So the standard method here is to apply the ratio test, and then we'll see if there are any conditions on x for which this series converges. So in the ratio test, you investigate this limit, the limit of the absolute value of the ratio of the n plus first term to the nth term. And if that comes out to less than 1, then you have a convergent series. That may put a condition on the values of x for which the series converges, or it could turn out that it converges for any x. We'll see in a second. So the absolute value part makes it so my negative 1 to the n doesn't matter. And when I look at my n plus first term, looking up here, I'm going to have a 2 times the quantity n plus 1 plus 1 up there. So it might be worth it to just simplify that as I go to reduce the amount of work I have to write down. So 2 times the quantity n plus 1 is 2n plus 2. And that means this exponent becomes 2n plus 3. The same thing happens to the factorial and the denominator. So there's the n plus 1 term, and then I divide by the nth term, which is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So in the next line, I'm going to split some things apart to prepare for cancellations. I'm going to pull an x squared out of that first term. So I can cancel it with the 2n plus 1 in the denominator. And I'm going to split off the first couple terms in this factorial in the denominator and write it as 2n plus 3 times 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1 factorial, and then my x term, x to the 2n plus 1. I'll leave that alone because I'm ready to cancel it out. And then we cancel the 2n plus 1 factorial. In the next line, I'm going to move the x dependence out of this limit because it's an n limit, so the x is a constant with respect to the limit. And that would just give me an absolute value of x squared out in front, but I know x squared is positive, so I'm just going to write it as x squared. And that limit unambiguously goes to 0, so I end up with an x squared times 0, or just 0. And this is certainly less than 1, no matter what value of x I choose. And so I can say the series converges for all real values of x. Equivalently, I could say the interval of convergence is negative infinity to infinity. So we've successfully represented this transcendental function, the sine of x, as an infinitely long polynomial, and that representation is valid for any value of x.